everybody, both uh, in-house and online. We are glad to have you this evening sharing with us. Um, traditionally, and uh, we would refer to this as Holy Week, would we not? Um, not that it does much for us in the reference, uh, but it is the traditional concept that the week in which Good Friday falls is Holy Week. And we do carry out a lot of traditional rituals, um, things we, that might help our own conviction. Um, uh, hopefully, it will translate into what I have been teaching, that whatever ritualistic methods we gravitate to would result in what I call spiritual maturity or spiritual development or spiritual growth. And so, um, for those of you who are around, we are shaping up for an exciting weekend. Uh, Friday evening, God's willing, at 7 o'clock, we're here for good, good Friday service. And uh, on Saturday morning, we are at the beach for baptism. Is it Saturday morning? And then on Sunday morning, we are here for Easter service. It's, it's an exciting weekend that is building up, and we are hoping that we are all preparing for that. So... Um, we're, we're talking again about prayer as the heartbeat of the church or the foundation of the church. We have been looking at how prayer contributes to our Christian development, Christian maturity, Christian growth. I talked about the fact that we, we, we often become traditional in our concept of uh, religious or Christian embrace and often having nothing to show for it. Um, it is only productive or effective if we engage in Christian either traditions or rituals or whatever and it results in some form of Christian maturity uh, uh, contributing to the testimony of the church. 
And when I say church, I'm not talking about VPI. I'm talking about the body of Christ, that, we, that whatever we engage in as it relates to prayer or Christian embrace or Christian rituals or Christian traditions or whatever we do should contribute to the advancement of the testimony of the church. And that is the value of the Christian to the whole walk of Christianity, that the Christian and the Christian life should contribute to the testimony of the church. So tonight we will take a look at prayer as, as, again as it contributes to Christian development because we say we cannot be a praying people and not a growing people. I, 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 I don't know if you get that. We, we cannot go to prayer meetings and cannot have 40-day and 21-day fast, and we are not a growing people. And I don't have any problem with people fasting. I don't profess to be Christ, so I just, I, I can't get to 20, 40 days. It was, it was a heaven assignment to Christ to do 40 days. I did not get that assignment. And those who got it can do well with it, but I don't need to. There's a sense of sobriety which comes out of people, uh, expected out of people who fast and pray. A sense of not just moral sobriety, but spiritual sobriety. A level of mental, moral, social, and spiritual control that is not common to the ordinary. And that's what the church benefits from. That, which is, that is what is supposed to become the attraction to people for the church because of how we, uh, a prayer, allow us to conduct ourselves as a reflection of Christ. Now, now Dr. Adam, Adam Redpath wrote a, a, an article. I'm enjoying reading it, but I want to read one line from it. So we all know theoret theoretically at least that the Christian life can only grow as it cultivates a habit of prayer. The Christian life can only grow as it cultivates a habit of prayer. So what we understand from that is that repentance and baptism is the initiation to Christian growth. Repentance and baptism is not the apex of Christianity. Repentance and baptism is the introduction to Christianity, and prayer is that which contributes to growth that a non-praying believer will never be a growing believer. And growth has nothing to do with height or width or circumference. It has to do with maturity, how we handle ourselves in challenging times, how we preserve testimony in the face of challenge. That's what it has to do that you cannot be a praying believer and have no control over your mind, over your emotion, and over your thoughts. Now, we're going to handle a few verses. Then he went on to say, and that prayer must be regular and disciplined if it is to be vital. It must be regular and disciplined, meaning prayer must have goals and purpose. That we must pray towards a goal, we must pray towards a purpose, and we must see that that comes to pass. Now, I, I kind of want to begin with this as we, as we are coming into this Easter season to talk about the value and the vitality of prayer. Uh, uh, Luke 11, that's the one we have there, 1 to 4. Now, now... <clears throat> This is what the, the, the scripture says. And you know something I, I initiated? We entered into a conversation about a countdown clock for the worship leaders. They give it to me first. They try to count me down first. It's just horrible the way they treat the bishop. He's the one who gets no time. And, and it came to pass that he was praying in a certain place, that, meaning Jesus. When he ceased or when he stopped, listen, one of his disciples, one of them, said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. Hold on, don't move. When he was through praying, one of them came to him and said, Lord, uh, we would like to be as impactful in our lives, in our prayer life, 
as John's disciples seem to be effective. Now, what do you glean from that? You glean from that that these guys were walking with Christ but did not learn from Christ the things they need to know. But John, who was not Christ, found it necessary to sit his disciples down and teach them how to pray to Christ and how to pray to affect their own lives. It was a certain degree of discipline that disciples detected in John's disciples that they did not have something that only prayer could produce. I think it brought about also a sense of embarrassment. That here it is, some disciples were walking with John, who was a cousin of Christ. And these disciples were actual disciples of Christ the God. And yet John's disciples seemed like they were more disciplined, more composed, and more mature than them. I'd be embarrassed too. You know, I mean, that is why it is, it is that such importance is placed on the quiet time by all who know the secret of growth in Christ. So growth does not take place necessarily in the cluster and loudness of a group. It is when you begin to assess yourself. Here's how prayer works. Prayer works through self-assessment. I don't have anybody to teach tonight. Prayer works through self-assessment. That which draws you to the cross is not so much loudness as much as quiet time self-assessment. When I see myself, I know that I need to go to God in prayer for this level of assistance. There are some things about me that I am not satisfied with that I have tried to fix and I cannot fix, I have to use prayer to address it. Um, so, the, the disciples said to him, if you would take time to teach us, we would love it. Because we believe that John's disciples are showing a level of maturity because they were good students of their leader. John took time to teach them to pray so that they might develop a solid spiritual life for the benefit of ministry and testimony. Now, here's the thing about it. The other thing to this is something that we don't have a lot in common with. That um, this, this disciple cared a lot. It was assumed that it was Peter, but this disciple cared a lot about how they were viewed as servants of Christ and how they were viewed as testimony bearers of the kingdom. It is important that we take into consideration how we are viewed by those who are looking on and prepare ourselves to become advocates of a solid testimony. And a lot of this has to do with what prayer, what prayer will produce in us. Let's look at some things that prayer can produce. Prayer can produce maturity, composure, strength, mind and self-control, uh, uh, strong worship, appetite for prayer and fasting, appetite for love, appetite for care, appetite for embracing each other and spreading the God. Prayer produces that. Here's what prayer can produce. Prayer can produce malice. Prayer can produce anger. Prayer cannot produce strife and wrath. Are you getting the picture? There are just some things that a prayer life cannot produce and should not produce. Animosity, lying, deceiving. Prayer cannot produce these things. Therefore, th those last things I mentioned are not products of a mature Christian life. The others are, but the latter is not. A lying believer is not a mature believer. An angry believer is not a mature believer. 
A deceptive believer is not a mature believer. A malicious believer is not a, is not a mature believer. Those things per cannot produce. Therefore, it cannot contribute to maturity or spiritual development. And therefore, it must be, it, it must be, it is important that we, that it matters to us how we are viewed. It must be important and, 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 and it must matter to us in the, in the confines of our testimony how we are viewed by those who look on on us, hear us, see us, come into contact with us. It must matter. You ever hear some believers say, I really don't care? What do you mean? What do you mean? Now, 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 you, you can get to the place where you don't care if it requires you to conform to stupidity. You can get to the place where you don't care if people have no desire to grow but to pull you down. But you cannot not care about how you are viewed by those who understand your testimony, who have heard your testimony, and is looking on to see it producing that which scripture requires. So let's go on to hear what, what Luke said, because we're going to go to John, and they have a time counting down. I mean, these guys are not big. And he said unto them, when you pray, say, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done as in earth, so in heaven. Come on. Give us, this, give us day by day our daily bread. Last one, four, we are going to go there and stop. And forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And, let, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Now, let's go to Matthew and see how Matthew's rendition of that same prayer works out. In Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, I, I say that much because the scribe actually wrote a lot. That's why his gospel has more chapters than the others out of 28. He wrote a lot. So I want to go from verse 1. It said, take heed that you do not your arms before men. Or do not parade yourself before men to get their, their, their uh, 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 for men, for people to praise you or do not live your life just for people to applaud you. For just for uh, human approval. Uh, to be seen of them. Otherwise, you have no reward of your Father which is in heaven. Two, therefore, when thou doest thine arms, or when thou make thy gift, or when thou come to bless the Lord, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. They are selfish brats. But when thou doest arms, let not thy left hand know what thy right hand doth. Do it that thy hands may be in secret, and thy father will see it in secret. Himself shall reward, so reward thee openly. Mm -hmm. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Really? For they love to pray standing in the synagogue and on the corners of the street, that they may be seen of men. Right? What? Uh -huh. Seeking to be famous of a free gospel that they may be seen up and verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou press, enter into thy closet. Please don't lock yourself into any two by one and suffocate in there. I mean, Jesus Christ. <laughs> don't you go into a closet wearing a red cap or something. Well, if you wear it, we'll be used it as a sign to find you. You know, I mean, if we can't find you, we see a red cap, we know it's you inside there. Don't do that. And shut the door. It's, the closet simply means a secret place. That's all it simply means. Doesn't mean the way you hang your clothes where it's, you know. I mean, of course, in some of these closets, there's no place even to pray anyway. Praise the Lord. <laughs> you can't kneel down because you know what is in there. You can't stand. Praise the 
praise the Lord. Precious Lord. I don't know if you myself go shout for it. And um, so when you get in and shout, Lord, pray to thy father which is in secret. And thy father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Uh -huh. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions. It means do not keep repeating yourself until you hear the right people say amen. But there are some people you want to hear you and say amen. If they don't say amen, you think you have to say it again until you hear them. As the heathens do, for they think that they shall be heard of their much speaking. Uh -huh. It wasn't uh, Jesus who was saying that here. Say that. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your father knoweth what things you need of. Before he, before you ask. Mm -hmm. After this manner, said Matthew documented that after Luke did not mention all the, the other mentioned in the, four, in, the, in the other eight verses. Luke didn't take time to talk about that. But Matthew the scribe realized that information is important, so he documented that leading up to this. So what we understand from Luke's writing was that all that took place in the first eight verses, because he's writing from the same gathering. But what mattered to Luke was what the disciple asked and what stemmed from it. Matthew thought it was important for him to document that because we are found in those, three, in the, in those eight verses. The frivolity of our own lives are found in those eight verses. And that was vital for Matthew to mention. Because when you read that, you find that that is also a part of the church. It's amazing how a book as concise as the scripture, comprises everything the church needs. <laughs> just amazing. So I said, after this man of prayer, just like Matthew said, when you pray, that's the same, like Luke says, the same thing. Say, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Hold on. So both of the guys documented that what Jesus tell them to say that you cannot pray to me if I will not have control over your life like I have control in heaven. Your prayer means nothing to me if when you are through praying, you still have control of your life and control of your decisions and control of your emotions. If all in your life is not meant to please me, then you have not prayed. You have just uttered vain, vain, vain words. You, what, what he's saying, you cannot pray to me and your life is still yours and solely yours. I must have a say over your life. There are some things you are going to do just because of me that has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Yeah. A friend of mine called, gave me a tremendous testimony this evening. It, it just sent goose pimples and I remembered some things he went through. I remember the things he preached. I remember the days when he was almost finished and it was given up for dead. And today, one of the best things, I, 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 I only heard about the, those things. He called me and he said, you know, he said, I told my wife and she said, tell nobody. She said, I have one man I have to tell. He said, who his name is, Clive Porter. That boy is my friend. And he called, I told, he said, man, I'm happy for you. I remember the time when you were left for dead. Look at you now. You see, when God has his way with you, he will bring you through stuff in order to bring you into stuff. I don't have anybody to teach more. I don't, I don't. You see, you can't ask God to bring you into stuff without bringing you through stuff. So thy will be done in me. Because I know when your will is perfected in me, your blessing will be perfected in my life. You can't ask to go into stuff without going through stuff. So, so, so that will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Hold that still there. Um, did you know that nobody in heaven argues with God? No angel, no nothing. Nobody argues with God. Whatever God wants in heaven, he gets. 
So he said, if you're going to pray and you're going to break through on me, this is what you need to say and you need to mean it. So we just don't come into some prayer meeting and say, let's recite the Lord's Prayer. What does that mean? What does reciting it mean? What part of it is going to transform your thinking and transform your life? Well, let's do the 23rd Psalm. How does it affect you? Lord is my, my shepherd, I shall not want, but I'm depressed. Does that make any sense? Are you seeing the point? You can't, you have to understand what these guys meant in their prayer. In the relationship they had. In order to document it for testimony and upon repeating it, it has the same effect on you. For it to produce the same fruit. I told you when I was coming up in the church, we have testimony. It used to be about three testimonies, sometimes four to a course, depending on how many people. You, you did that in Barbados? Uh, yeah, yeah, you come to, to testimony service. Uh, my Havia used to do that. He used to do the testimony service. He said, we have three testimony to one service, one course. If it's only six people there, so you have, you know, you have to. But if you have 20 people, uh, four testimony. So you can cut down. But in the midst of it, probably 90% of the people who get up to testify begin by saying this. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. Save the wretch like me. They have never been through anything, you know. Save the wretch like me. Once. You see, you, you see the point? You see the point? Now, without taking a, 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 any thought of what John Newton was going through to write that, so there has got to be an appreciation of the experience so that the recitation of the word can have effect. Jesus said, this is what you need to pray. I'm going to show you something. I'm going to hopefully get out of your way before Good Friday night. Let me, let me show you. He said, give us this day our daily bread. That's what Matthew said, meaning uh, uh, we trust you for our provision on a daily basis. And this is critical. This is critical. Where, where did you go? No, no, we're not, for, we're not forgiving anybody yet. We're talking about, give us this day our daily bread. That is critical. Why is that so? It is because it's a prayer which tells you that tomorrow is not promised to you. So trust him for today's provision. And should tomorrow come, trust him for the same. But don't trust into tomorrow until you have appreciated today. So give us today our daily supply of blessing. And don't cause us to look towards tomorrow, being gluttonous about what it brings before we are able to appreciate today. So now we can forgive those who are troubling us. And forgive us our debts, the guy over the other writing said, give us day by day. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Look, look at how it is written. Present continuous. And forgive us our debts. Luke says, for we also. He didn't say, for we are going to. Matthew says, as we have forgiven. He did not say, as we will be able to or aspiring to. It says, every time somebody has done us wrong, we have forgiven them, so please forgive us our situation. So the contingency, look at how it's written because you're going to miss it. The contingency is up on us forgiving first. Oh, I just lost my class. The contingency is what? Upon us doing what? Forgiving first. So now, if you hurt me and I don't forgive you, I disqualify myself from asking for forgiveness. Wow. I'll tell you the truth, boy. I'll tell you the truth. The easiest thing in the Christian church is to forgive. What? 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 But the truth of the matter is, listen to this now, it might be the most difficult thing to do, but it's the greatest blessing of growth. 
If you can bring yourself to for, forgiveness, does not mean that um, uh, 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 I, I really don't have anything against you, but I don't have anything to do with you. Jesus Christ. That is how they're talking, St. Anne. You know, uh, St. Anne, anyway. I, I really don't have anything against you, but I don't want to have anything to do with you. Now, now, understand in life, there are some people you're going to have to cut ties with. But you must be able to wish them the best. And help them if you can. So that's not what, where did the girl move my thing to? We are, I, I think we're going <laughs> to, the next time we come here, we're going to have to get all our texts from Mary Mount so that they don't miss. Well, praise God. <laughs> praise God. Our, we should have all our texts wearing braces, anything that works for us. So now, um, but to forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors means that we, we can't just say we forgive people and then hold grudges against them. And that takes a strong discipline. Believe me, some folks are hard to forgive. Why are you looking at me like I'm the only backslider in here? Some folks are hard to forgive. Because when you go to bed and think about what they have done, you wake up wondering if Jesus will just allow you to hold that one and still forgive you. Do I have anybody? There's nobody inside here. But when you can bring yourself to break yourself loose of that, you have no idea how, how developed you become in your spirituality. Just, just that one move catapults you to a level of spiritual growth. It's hard to imagine. Um, forgive us our debts. I need to get to somewhere before we finish. As we forgive, I want that to register, that it is a present continuous approach, that no evil shall befall you that you can't forgive. That's what the text meant. No man should do you so much wrong that you can't forgive them. Forgiveness does not mean, I want to explain it to you, forgiveness does not mean that you have to continue the relationship. That's not what it means. But it means that you must not hold anything against the person to the extent that you want to see them end. Uh, the truth of the matter is that there's some relationship you're in that will keep you sinning. Why nobody can talk to me? You, you understand? So I'm trying to explain it for you to get it. There are some people in your life that will just keep you sinning. And so you can forgive them, but you have to end that relationship. Because if you stay in that relationship, I'm not talking about marriage, or just any relationship. If you stay in it, you're not going to see heaven. So in order to see heaven, you forgive them for what they have done and sever the relationship. But love them from afar and wish the best for them. That's what that text means. Wow. I don't know for you out there, but if you're in here, there's some people in really deep thoughts inside here. You hear me? Just deep thoughts, wondering, <laughs> did I let go some people that I shouldn't let go? And is there any, more, any ones I have to go back and find? But did you get the gist of what I'm trying to teach from the text? All right, so let's go to the other one then, since we, 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 we understand the forgiveness. And, and lead us not into temptation. Do not leave us to be destroyed by the tempter's hand, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, meaning you own the kingdom. The, you own the kingdom, and the kingdom includes us. One of the things that we do as Christians, we think of kingdom as heaven in the celestial and not in terms of the church on earth. We cannot be children of God and not be a part of the kingdom. I just messed up the church. 
It is not about, you. the kingdom is not only when you get to heaven. If you're a child of the king, you, are a part of, you cannot be a child of the king and not a part of the kingdom. So if the king owns the church, then I am in the kingdom. You can do whatever you want with me because thine is the kingdom. You own the kingdom. I'm a part of it. I am your subject. Whatever you ask me to do or whatever you command me to do, I have no choice but to do it. I am your subject. Hmm? All right. And if thine is the kingdom, then the power is yours, which means all the authority to assign me, protect me, lead me, govern me is all in your hand. Just help me not to resist you. Note how I phrase that. It is the propensity of the human mind to resist everything that is good towards God. Everything that God wants us to do, the propensity of the human mind is to fight against it. And, and sometimes we fight against it and blame it on how people look at us. Well, uh, uh, you, you want to sing a song? I can sing, but I don't want to. Why? Because of how they're looking at me. Really? What kind of a madness is that? You mean, so, so now you want to glorify the Lord, the Lord do you pray to, you know. <laughs> we, we, we had a preacher in, in our sister church on Sunday, and I said to the preacher, your wife can bring the solo. Of course, you don't have to listen to the voice, just listen to the word. Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. <laughs> wow. Wow. And not just the power is yours, the glory, which means let me not take any credit for the things you have, you have blessed me with in my life. Let me, help me to give you the glory. Everything is about you helping me. Because the human mind is jealous after everything that is powerful. And every credit of God the human mind wants to take. And the, the Bible says that God's a jealous God. So you've got to be careful how you replace him with stuff and people. I don't have anybody to teach now. you got to say, the, the, the Bible says that God is a jealous God. You have to replace. Be careful how you replace him with stuff and people. Um, I'm going to run to another one. No, go ahead, baby, 14. Forever and ever, so let it be. Amen. There can be no change to that. That's what it means. That did not come at the end of the chapter. It came in the middle of the chapter and then move on to something else. Do not alter that. That is so let it be. This is who God is and how his subject must conform. All right, let's go now to, to Matthew 26, 38 to 40 because I want to use that on top of this stuff. About how prayer helps. You remember I talked to you about um, how the disciple came to Jesus? One of the disciples came to Jesus and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Remember we just talked about that? And we're talking about the fact that it was, it was um, what, what did I say, 38 maybe to 40, I think, 38 to 40. You remember, you remember how we, 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 we talked about that, that, that the disciples said to, to Jesus, can you teach us to pray like John taught his disciples? And we talk about the fact that what they saw in John's disciples was something they did not have. And they realized it was, it, it, it was, Traits or disciplines that was brought on by prayer. And that's what happens when you look at people in, in Christian walk and Christendom who are composed, who are, who certain things don't knock them over, who they are not just walking wobbly. You know that they are not sent from heaven, but they are, they are, they are products of prayer. It is not unusual to see people going through stuff and you can't even tell they are going through. Because they're not loud, they're not rambunctious, they're not, you know, distracted, and they're not disruptive, they're not backsliding, they're not going on and on. Because over time, prayer helps them to 
composed are to be at a mature place where they trust God and believe God that what they're going through will pass. They just need the discipline to wait. And so when we, we mentioned that in the beginning of the ministry of Christ as he was walking with, I'm going somewhere with this. The beginning, when these boys said to Jesus, can you teach us to pray? Like John also taught his disciples. And you would have thought that over the period of time, they would have taken the formula that Jesus gave and would have matured into a place that he could trust them to stand with him, to see what he's going through and walk with him. It's like, you know, I've been teaching for 42 years and there are still some people who haven't gotten it. They are so lost in themselves, so carried away by their own women fancy that nothing is helping them. And you can look at some people and you can tell that nothing you have taught ever passed through their ears, let alone stuck in their brain, because their behavior has never changed. Never changed. I will tell you something about my girl, this. When we came to the church, you think my girl, this was this calm and composed? That girl listened to her pastor, and I'm dead serious. And learn, and learn, and learn, and learn, and we could not be proud of the example she is. I'm just being serious. Sometimes we don't talk about our people when we see them. I, Madam Clerk, there's a time you have to pray to calm her down. Pray to calm her down. But she would come and listen and people don't think she's listened to her pastors, listened to the teaching, and she would learn and develop and learn. And look at that. So do we have to pray for her to talk? Praise God. Um, do I get an amen, Madam Clerk? Amen? Yes, 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 yes. We can't say, you know, we didn't pray about the clerk walking soft. She always walks soft, but the rest of it will be. Praise the Lord. So you would have, I, I referenced you to the beginning of the, of, of the Lord's ministry when, he, when the guys felt like John's disciples were outdoing them. Did you see that? Did you see us reference that? And they spent an entire now three years of ministry to three and a half with Jesus after getting the formula. You know, get out of here. After he gave them the formula at the beginning of Matthew and, and, and in Luke, they spent another three, and a, three, three and years and three months or so with Jesus. And look at this. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry here with me and watch with me. Mean, stay with me and watch with me. I need your help. I need your support. Hold on, don't move it yet. Why? why? I'm going to drop this girl off in Bus Cabela or something. Did you see that? You see that? I'm trying to get you to see the thing. After getting the formula, the question is, what did they do with it? What were they distracted by? What did they want to achieve? Did they have a personal agenda and not one that is tied to the master? He said, I'm going through. And if there was a, ever a time I need you to stand with me, it is now. And you should have been able to. Because not only did you get the formula, you should have had the experience. You should have learned from me and watched me. one of the reasons that they were drawn to John's disciples was because John's disciples were sold out to the mission. They were about the mission and not about themselves. When you're about the mission, you study the formula of the mission and people see the mission in you before they see you. Now, wow, it is so important that we understand 
the urgency of learning the heart of God. So important. So, as he was traveling to Golgotha, the guys who he taught the prayer formula and the guys who he demonstrated a life of anointing before and composure and discipline and mind management and emotional, manage, emotional management or feeling. All of these things, he managed that before them because he was a man I taught you on Sunday. Christ was a man who had all the characteristic traits of every regular human being. So he had everything we had to manage, he had to manage. You know. I mean, you have to understand, he was out there, girls liked him too, you know. Yes, you know. Eastern pretty girls, but he knew his mission. And he stayed focused. That mission, let's go to certain end of it. You're doing well. We're not going to leave you at Moscow Bell again. And he went a little further, meaning he walked off from them because they did not give the impression that they were even interested in what he was saying. They were so focused on themselves, their own personal agenda, aggrandizement, feelings, ambitions, that they did not hear the urgency in his voice. He went a little further. And he fell on his face. It did not mean that he tripped. It meant that he prostrate. Huh? Fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Hold on, hold on. That is what maturity in spirit and prayer is. Expressing what you can't do, but be open to God to do it in you anyway if he wants. But if this was a Pentecostal church right there, I'd cut me a dance. Confessing what I'm not able to do, but I'm open to you to do it through me if you want to. Because I know if you're going to do it through me, even though I can't, you can. And there are some things we just got to open to God to do that will shock the devil. He thinks it's you, but it's God doing it because you know you could not do anything about it. But if God wants to, maturity says, let him do it. Nevertheless, so let's, here is the crux of the matter. We get down to four. And he left where he was praying. <laughs> and came back to the guys who were only interested in their positions. Came back to the guys who were only interested in what they were called. You remember when the guys, the folk, when Jesus was walking and folks ran up to him to be healed and the disciples saying, stay away, like there were some bodyguards not allowing people to go? Yeah. They continued that behavior after getting the formula all the way to Golgotha. Always walking, watching people being fed, watching lame heal, <laughs> watching man at pool up, Bethesda get up. It don't mean an earthly thing to them. They are just a part of the circus. You see, prayer offers a level of spiritual maturity, maturity which, which separates you from the nonsense. That's what prayer does. It's not because you're better than, but prayer offers, it's like, it's like um, when you are grown, there are certain childish things you don't get into anymore. You don't have the appetite for it. No, you know, you, 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 it just doesn't fit you anymore when you are grown, you know. And sometimes you get impatient with children running around and you used to be worse than that. You, don't, you can just tell in your adulthood what your, your childhood used to be. Just, just uncontrollably. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But he, he come to the disciples. I like that he wrote it like that because Matthew, here's what happened. These guys who are writing this thing were writing about themselves to you. Know. They were a part of the group who was sitting down, they're not moving, you know. I like how Luke addressed Acts and, and, and how John addressed the, the, the resurrection of Christ and so forth. They don't mention when they're speaking the third person. So, so I think that they were, and, and I'm a person of words in the text. Uh, he, he did not say, and he commit to his disciples. I think that's a little bit too uh, endearing for such failure in character. To say his disciples is to associate these failing men with the Christ who needed them. So he said, the, as if they are not a part of him. But how could they be after getting the formula and it's only wrapped up in who they are? I'm still trying to wonder, those of you watching online, why the folks in here just keep staring at me like that. Like, pensive mood, as if. Are you getting it? Are you getting it? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? So he came to them and find that these rascals sleeping. At the time when he needed them most, they were of no help to him. What were they doing? Satisfying their own tiredness and could not stand with him in his time of weariness. And he said unto Peter, tell me, tell me the God's honest truth. And this will break the heart of a rat bat, let alone Jesus. Tell me, after all I taught you, and after all you have seen in me, you could not stand with me one hour? You asked me to teach you how John, John's disciples would not have done that. Wow. <laughs> Ooh. I wanted to resonate with you. I said, how many times Jesus counted on you after blessing you and you were a no-show? Because everything is about you and your feelings and your thoughts, your aspirations, the things you want to accomplish. And the one time Jesus wants you to stand up, he's a burden. Um, so, so Peter, what? Could you not, have not watch with me one hour? Let's look at what 41 says because I got to get out of this and, and finish. I got to finish. I got to finish. Uh, what, what did my text say? Okay. Then he said, watch and pray <laughs> that you enter not into temptation. Meaning, it doesn't mean to open your eyes and pray. It means to be sober in your prayer life and be focused on the intent. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Make sure your spirit override your flesh so that you can get from God. Flesh doesn't mean what you pinch. It means mind. The spirit is willing to pray, but the mind does not have the discipline. So keep yourself alert and focused on the God of your prayer and the things you want to get from him so that you not fall asleep at the most critical time or you don't fall apart. Sleep does, it doesn't mean that you go off into a doze. It means fall apart or lose focus. Lose a grip of yourself, a grip of the assignment, a grip of the agreement, a grip of the covenant. It takes 
discipline which can only be produced by prayer. And so you heard me talk, and I'm closing, you heard me talk about we're coming into, into the Easter season. And it's all about a tradition. It's all about a tradition. It's all about the things of celebration. And we would like you to come to our service on, on Friday evening. We would really like you to come to our service on Easter Sunday. But we have to break away from, from tradition and become real about God. If your prayer life does not lead you to a place of maturity where you are not a disappointment to the kingdom, then you need to pray again. Because prayer is not about fame. It's about producing in you a life of maturity where it refuses to produce that which becomes an embarrassment to testimony and kingdom. I thank you for joining me today. I really am grateful that you tuned in or you came out. I trust that this was a blessing to you, that it helps you to see yourself in the light of the privilege of prayer, and in so doing, help you to preserve testimony and kingdom reputation. Let us stand. God bless you. I appreciate you for coming. Listen, if you would be a blessing to our ministry, we'd be grateful. We want you to stand with us as we do ministry, not just here, but around the world. Our, our giving platforms are up, and we want you, please, to uh, share a seed into our ministry. Would you do that? We are building things around the world and helping the unfortunate. We want you to help us if you can. And uh, we so appreciate you if the Lord speaks to your heart and, um, and, and so impress upon you to sow into good ground. We really would like for you to do that. Let us pray. Father, we thank you tonight that you have enabled us to share your word and the inspiration of the Spirit helps us to clarify for our spiritual growth and maturity and for spiritual strength. We pray you bless this word to our lives. Continue to help us to grow into that which represents you and the kingdom and not ourselves. We ask you to bless the giving tonight from wherever it comes. Bless to our baskets and honor yourself in our giving and our worship. We give you thanks for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Looking forward to see you on Friday evening. We trust that you'd come out to be a part of 7 o'clock. There's going to be a great worship service here for Good Friday night. And we look forward to seeing you on Sunday. What a great time we are planning to have. We believe the Lord will be here with us. Have a great night. Thank you for joining. We love you. Jehovah Shalom. Bye-bye now.